Good morning, Parkwood. It is good to see you here in worship this morning. It's good to be in this place. I wanna welcome those of you who are joining us online. If you are a guest with us this morning, we wanna welcome you to our fellowship and I wanna take this opportunity just to point out that there is a card in front of you and the chair back in front of you. If you'll take the time to fill it out, drop it into the offering plate at the end of the worship service. This allows us to get to know you and, and you to get to know us a little bit better. We are just grateful that you are here this morning. Um, today, we have been so blessed. I've actually uh, sat through two services already um, and listened to the word being preached because this morning is sort of a pastoral assistant day and, and the 930 service was led by Casey Shaw, who's our new campus pastor. And uh, you guys get to hear Joseph Anderson this morning at the 11 o'clock service. Um, so you're gonna be blessed. And these guys are preaching to us from Ephesians 2. So to sort of uh, prepare our hearts for what Christ unfolds in Ephesians 2, we're gonna read through Ephesians 1, the other parts of this service. So I want us to hear the word of the Lord this morning. Ephesians 1, 3 says this, "'Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, "'who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing "'in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved Father. We love you because you first loved us. When we were dead in our sin, you knew us, you came to us, and you reached into our world and pulled us out of darkness and have now seated us into your marvelous light. And so we respond to that this morning as we sing. We respond to that as we preach your word, as we listen to your word being read, and as we apply your word to our heart we are here for your glory and you alone. May you be pleased in the affection of your, of your children's heart this morning as we respond to your gospel. In your name we call and we pray, amen. Let's stand. Death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. Yes. My orphan heart was given a name. And my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death. When death was arrested and my life began Come on, let's sing it Oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Amen. My shame was a ransom, a faithful evil. He canceled my debt and he calls me his friend. When death was arrested and my life began. is over me you 
have made me new now life begins with you oh it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new Savior displayed on a criminal's cross Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But that's not the end, church But then Jesus arose with our freedom in end That's when death was arrested and my life began is over me you have made me new now life begins with you oh, it's your endless love pouring down on us you have made us new now the song of the redeemed oh we're free free forever we're free come join the song of all the redeemed yes we're free free forever amen when death was arrested and my life began oh we're free free forever we're free come join the song of all the reading yes we're free free forever amen when death was arrested in my life begin when death was arrested in my life begin oh when death was arrested in my life begin Sunset free is free indeed. Let's celebrate that this morning. Who am I that the highest would welcome? I was lost, but he brought me his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun?
our sin. And again, Christ came into our world. He snatched us from the miry clay. He set our feet on solid rock. That's what we're here to proclaim this morning. We're here to proclaim to Him the wonderful works that He has done. It's not about us, but it's for His glory. So we respond as we proclaim who we are in Him. We are responding to what He has done for us on the cross through the Son. So let's sing it, church. redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the, fulfillness of, for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Church, in him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So in him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire, acquire possession of it. To what? The praise of His glory. So praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. I teach you this as we sing the gospel together. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. 
to fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Sing this with me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory. Praise forever to the King of Kings. Now that you've heard it, sing the second with us. To reveal the kingdom come and to reconcile the lost. To redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died praise the Father praise the Son and praise the Spirit free God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. And the moment that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, till that stone was moved for good. For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who'd come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born In the Spirit, in the flame Now this gospel truth of old By His blood and by His name In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me God's people said, Amen. Good morning. My name is Joseph Anderson. I serve here as a pastoral apprentice, and it is my absolute pleasure to be here with you all this morning. So if you will pull out a Bible, um, you will need that this morning. If you are a guest or you just don't have a Bible with you, you can look under the chair backs. 
We will be in Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. In the chair Bible, that's on page 976. And uh, while you are getting there, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Okay? You ready? All right. So when I was a kid, I had issues. Like, I'm pretty sure my parents questioned if I was all there at times. I mean, I was just not a good kid. Fights, disobedient to my parents, multiple trips back to my house in the police car, illegal activity, the whole shebang. And see, a lot of you guys would have no idea about that for me. So parents, keep praying. There's hope, okay? So anyway, when I was about 17 years old, my father decided to start letting me drive his old Honda Accord. All right, I loved that car. It was like a 92. I learned my, to drive my first car. It was a stick shift. Mm, I loved that car so much, in fact, that I never took care of it. I probably should have mentioned that I was also irresponsible. Anyway, so the car broke down, right? And my dad did what any father would do. He took it to the shop, and I thought he took it to the shop so that he could fix it. But instead... He sold it, and obviously I was brokenhearted, and I don't know if he felt bad or what because eventually I talked him into letting me drive the family car occasionally when I needed to go places, and I'm sure it was against his better judgment, and I know he regretted it because I also totaled that car. So what if I told you that next my father went to to a car dealership, looked around for a brand new car, saw a beautiful BMW sitting there in the parking lot and he bought it and then he brought it home and he dropped the keys in my hand and said, son, I bought this car for you because I love you. And as a matter of fact, your mother and I both had to sell our cars in order to be able to purchase you this car. Some of you guys are looking at me in unbelief because that definitely didn't happen. But if it did, (laughs) if it did, that would be unbelievable. I had not earned or deserved another car. I had not earned my parents' trust. And it is simply just not the way the world works. But the story The text that we are going to study today is unbelievable like that, but times a billion. So if you all will stand with me as we begin to read the Lord's word. Again, we are in Ephesians 2, verses 1 1 through 10. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, you all may be seated. Let us, let us pray. My God, you know how desperately I need your grace. You know how desperately we all need your grace. And so, Father, as I proclaim the gospel this morning, I pray that by grace you would penetrate the hearts of your children and the hearts of unbelievers, that those who are dead in their sin would walk out of here changed, and that those who have known Christ 
will be overwhelmed by the lavish grace that you have poured out on us in Christ. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus, amen. So the main idea of the text today is the powerful grace of God in salvation raises hopelessly dead sinners to newness of life in Christ. So we will start with our dead and powerless condition in verse 1. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So Paul here is writing presumably to a predominantly Christian audience, and that would account for the reason that he uses past tense. Were dead, once walked, etc. And I would also assume that in a room this size, there are scattered throughout Christians walking faithfully with Christ. But I would also dare to assume that there may be some here who are unsure. Maybe some of you are here visiting, trying the God thing out. And let me just say that we are so glad that you are here. But I say all that today to say that in this section, I will predominantly use present tense because, Christian, we must remember who we were. And for those of you who are searching, let me as graciously as I can take this opportunity to lovingly level with you about who the Bible says that you are. So, let's pause for a moment. Maybe pretend like we're not in church or like we're maybe the original audience. And what if somebody said something like this to you? Like, what is Paul talking about? We're not dead. We don't follow the world, and we certainly do not follow the devil. Maybe, maybe this was applicable to his audience in like 19 AD, but this is America. It's 2019. We are autonomous. We are free. We make things happen, and in our heart of hearts, we believe two things. That we are the maker of our own destiny, and deeply rooted in that is this that we are the captain of our own salvation. But Paul says, no, you are dead. You are consumed by the world, influenced by the devil, and enslaved by your flesh. And that is a far cry from you are basically a good person. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, I am here to tell you this morning that the message of the Bible is different than that of the world. And we must stop preaching, believe in yourself, and the world will fall at your feet. It is not true. Apart from Christ, we are dead. And before you turn me off because you're breathing and you're thinking and your heart's beating and you're like, there's there's no way I'm dead if all that's happening, let me submit to you then that maybe you are dead in the way that matters most. For what should be most important to you. Your soul is lifeless if you are blind to the glory of Jesus. If you are deaf to the voice of his spirit, if you have no love for God, no awareness of his reality, no leading to cry out for him, no desire to be with his people, hear me. Friends, you are not in Christ. And if you are outside of Christ, you are the equivalent of a corpse alienated from God and alienated from the source of life. So we see in verse 1 that our transgressions and our sins have alienated us. Before God, we are both rebels and failures, dead in our sins and trespasses. And then he adds this phrase, I'm using present tense, in which we walk. You see, this is important. Paul is not making some ambiguous accusation against men and women, arbitrarily calling them dead in sin. On the contrary, he provides a detailed description on how it is the dead walk, and we have to ask ourselves, is that me? So there are three ways in which the dead walk. I mentioned them earlier, but 
Number one, consumed with the world, verse two. Influenced by Satan, verse two, and enslaved to our flesh. And if we're honest with ourselves, many of us can relate to that. Is it not true that culture, not God, defines our values? Our views align with worldviews of the day, worldviews that are hostile to God and lost in sin. These influences provide a script for our day-to-day life. Value money, long for power, love yourself, do as you please, follow your heart, eat, drink, and be merry, for there is no God. So day after day, we go chasing things that have been created rather than creator. This is no coincidence because the enemy of our souls lives here. We see it in verse 2, that those who are dead in their sins follow the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So, everyone look at me. I'm going to say something hard. When we follow the course of this world, who we're really following is the devil. Satan is prince and ruler here. And I know we're in the West, and we don't like to talk about the devil, but we must wake up because the most dangerous enemy is an undetected one. And God has graciously put it in the text. We have an enemy who is courting us to sin and leading millions to death, and we prefer to walk largely unaware. Look at verse 2. He is the prince of the power of the air. This is the only time that Paul, or any other biblical author for that matter, refers to the domain of air as as the domain of Satan. So why does he do that? I believe he is trying to make emphatic that our enemy is everywhere. Think about air. It's there when we awake. It's there in the morning with our coffee. It's at our jobs. It's in our schools. It's there when we're watching TV and there when we're going to bed. And our enemy is in all these places, tempting us, luring us, enticing us. And outside of Christ, We are hopeless to fight it. No preacher once said this. Because we share in the nature of sinfulness and exist in the same sphere of rebellion against God, we respond naturally to his leadings and to his influence. We are on the same spiritual wavelength as the enemy. And as if our condition was not severe enough, we are also enslaved to our flesh. God created the human body to desire food and sleep and sex and all of these things are natural and good. But when we refer to our flesh, we are speaking of our propensity to turn hunger into gluttony, sleep into laziness and sex into lust. And brothers and sisters, hear me. Our ingrained self-centeredness, our flesh is horrible bondage. We are so turned inward that we miss God. We have not responded in gratitude or praise to the evidence of his eternal power or to his divine creation. That is why Paul says in Romans 8, verse 8, he says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And let me add this, that those who are in the flesh do not want to. Paul is describing the doctrine of our total depravity. That is, that all aspects of our being have been infected with the deadly disease of sin, and we are morally incapable of responding to God. To put it simply, our flesh is in love with the world and in sync with Satan because they have a common enemy, God. And how naturally that flows into verse 3. And you were, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. All of us, all of mankind, deserving of God's wrath. Paul leaves no doubt. There is no one excluded. We are all subject to God's wrath. 
And this wrath of God is not in spite or malice or animosity or revenge. Instead, it is God's personal righteousness and constant hostility toward evil. It is his settled refusal to compromise with it and his resolve instead to condemn it. And we are all guilty. The word hopeless does not even begin to justify our condition. Hebrews 10.31, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I feel the heaviness in the room right now, and we should stop here. Guilty of the wrath of God is what you and I deserve. But thank God for verse 4. It says, but you in your wisdom heard the gospel and made a decision to follow Christ. No? Okay. But you, grasping your sin, made a decision to become a better person. Uh Uh-uh. We have established what the text says about you and me. We are dead in sin. We are following the world and the devil and our flesh. The text says that we are utterly depraved and powerless to do anything about it. Verse 4 says, but God. That is why verse 4 is one of the most glorious verses in all the Bible. These two words, in and of themselves, in a sense, contain the whole of the gospel. So let us dive in gladly into God's phenomenal intervention. Verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So feel the intensity and the swiftness of the transition from verses 3 to verse 4. In an instant, we are moved from desperation to hope. And with the gravity of our previous condition of our mind, Paul now transitions to the wondrous mercy of God. You see, brothers and sisters, the importance of verse 3 is not in the emphasis placed on our death, not for the believer. The importance of verse 3 is to draw our attention to God's phenomenal intervention for us in Christ. Just like you needed to understand what type of child I was to understand why I did not deserve a new car, we needed to understand the truth of verses 1 through 3 to understand grace. If you got here late this morning and you walked into me saying, and my dad brought me a new car, you missed it. You probably just shrugged your shoulders and sat down disappointed that Jeff wasn't preaching. Without verses one through three, brothers and sisters, we miss and take for granted God and his grace. We cannot fully understand God's grace unless we understand how earnestly we have earned his wrath. See what Paul says in chapter one, starting in verse 18. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know, jumping down to verse 19 now, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. So brothers and sisters, verses one through three are there that you may feel the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us. It took power to save you. It took power to transfer us from the domain of darkness into his marvelous and glorious light, and it took power to take us from being objects of wrath to vessels of grace. You did not make a decision to do that. You did not make a decision to overcome the world, defeat Satan, conquer sin, and raise yourself from the dead. No, God did that. And we, are, we were children of wrath, not children of God. Yet God, in his grace, acquits the guilty. So I repeat, only the person who has understood something of the greatness of his wrath will be mastered by the greatness of his mercy. And only those who have experienced the greatness of God's mercy can understand anything of how great his wrath must truly be. You see, his wrath and his love They are not mutually exclusive. They must be held in tension. 
what we were by nature and whose we are by grace. And we see it clearly in the text. Verse one, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And you and we were children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God. So this leads to a question. What on earth motivated God's intervention? Was it that we were special or because we were worthy of saving? No, we see the answer clearly here in verse four. It says, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. So God's saving initiatives are found in his mercy and in his love. God acted on our behalf simply because he is loving and gracious in character. His saving act toward us was completely unmerited. Brothers and sisters, this is the gospel, is it not? That Jesus would take on flesh and suffer hunger and thirst as we did. That he would endure the hostility of believers. Quote, unquote. The Pharisees of men and that he would be hung on a cross and die the death that we deserved to die so that we may be made alive in Christ. This is Romans 5.8. But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we were consumed with the world and influenced by Satan, Enslaved to our flesh while we were depraved, Christ died. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath that we may drink freely of his grace. And why did he do it? Because he is merciful and because he has loved us with a great love. Even while we were dead in our trespasses, verse five says, God made us alive. And that is the main point. We were dead, God made us alive. Salvation is more than forgiveness, it is deliverance from death, slavery, and wrath, and God's phenomenal act of intervention made us alive. Could the news get any better? We have gone from the depths of human depravity to being made alive. And we are not just made alive, but we are made alive with Christ. If you are a Christian, you have been raised to life with Christ. And this has a multitude of implications scattered throughout the Bible. But let's just turn back one page and look at chapter one. Pastor Chad has already read a lot of these this morning, but let's just read them again for emphasis. Verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse four, he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. Verse seven, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Verse 13 and 14, in him we also, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Brothers and sisters, the gospel is good news. We are alive with Christ, and that means that what God has accomplished for Christ, he has accomplished for us who believe. What is true of the Redeemer is also true of the redeemed, and we see it in the text we have heard over and over again how Christ was raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God. But what must excite our amazement now is that Paul is talking about us. See verse six. But God being rich in mercy, verse six, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So do you see this? Because Christ has been raised, so have you. Because Christ has been seated, so have we. 
Who are we, brothers and sisters, that we should share in the destiny of God? It is as if when Christ's heart started beating and he got up out of the grave 2,000 years ago, you and I got up with him. Does this not blow your mind? Why would God do that for us? We are filthy. We deserve his wrath. Why? Why? The Bible always has an answer, doesn't it? Verse 7. So that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God's ultimate purpose in saving people for himself was to display his grace for all eternity. The grounds of our salvation is God's mercy and his love, but the goal of it was the promotion of his kindness and grace. His choosing of depraved men and women to become recipients of his mercy and call them sons and daughters will be to the praise of his glorious grace for all eternity for ages as far as the mind can reach. Those who have been saved will worship at the feet of the throne. They will say with one voice, salvation belongs to our God, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. To him be glory and honor and power forever and ever and ever. Christian, the reason that God saved you was not primarily so that you would not go to hell. The reason that God saved you is so that God could display his grace in you. And we must not forget that it is all by his grace. His mercy is by grace, his love by grace, him making us alive and raising us and seating us. It is all by grace. And we see it in verse 5 in Paul's interjection. By grace you have been saved. Think about it. He is in the midst of astounding truth, and he interrupts his train of thought that he may make sure that we understand that this is all by grace. He is screaming from the pages to make sure that you in the front row and you in the balcony understand that you have been saved by grace. By grace you have been saved. And he continues to unpack this further in verse 8 as he speaks of God's powerful grace and salvation. Verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, Paul's cry from verse 5 is picked up here with a slight deviation. He says that you were saved by grace through faith. And it is very likely that many of you have been sitting here thinking, what about faith? Don't don't we contribute faith? Mm. The Bible loves it when you ask a question. Yes, we must believe, we must have faith, but the sovereignty of God in raising dead men and women to life is not the discrediting of faith, it is in fact the creation of it. It is indeed the evidence that we have been raised to life. Our faith is not some meritorious work that God then responds to. On the contrary, it is at its core our responding to God. Look at the very next words. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. So what is this right here in verse 8? Put your finger on it if you have your Bible open. And this right there in verse 8. This is both grace and faith. It's all of it. Grace is a gift. Faith is a gift. Salvation is a gift. We must never think of salvation as some kind of transaction where I bring my faith and then God responds with his grace. Salvation is a gift of God's abundant kindness and his love that he has lavishly poured out on us. Look at these couple of verses with me. Acts 13, 48. I'll give you guys a second. It says this. And when the Gentiles heard this, 
they begin rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life, believed. By grace, God has appointed, and many on that day believed because God was gracious. Acts 18, 27. And when he wished to cross the Chia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to display and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who, through grace, had believed. So, brothers and sisters. This is the point that I am trying to make. Faith that we receive is a gift from God. It is not the one work that we contribute to our salvation. Saving faith is at its essence our abandoning all of our attempts to save ourselves and casting ourselves on what God has done for us. Think about it logically. If our faith were the initiating factor, then verse 7 makes no sense. If it is indeed our faith that prompts God to grace, you know who we would be praising for all eternity? Us. We could honestly boast in that. We were wise enough to believe, or maybe we were humble enough to believe, or we gave the faith so we deserve God's grace. But Paul makes it clear that it is all a gift that we may not boast. Paul says it well in his earliest letter to the Corinthians. He says, what do you have that you do not receive? If in fact you do receive it, why do you boast as if you haven't received it? And earlier in the letter he says in chapter 1, and since we have received the salvation, this salvation, the one who boasts must boast in the Lord. There is no one who should be exalted in our salvation but God. And there is no one who should be praised for all eternity but God. So, brothers and sisters, let us remember that we have been saved by grace. Last section. God's prepared works for his new creation. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There is so much I desire to say here, but I will be brief. So we see in verse 9 a negative connotation applied for works, right? We cannot be saved by them, but now it says that we have been saved for good works. So the question is, are works good or bad? Yes. Right? To put it simply, works are bad when we seek to use them as a qualifier, either for boasting or salvation. But they are good when they flow as a consequence or fruit of God's gracious salvation. So see this. Though we could never be saved by our good works, it was always God's intention that we be saved for them. Or it could be said like this. It is faith alone that saves, but faith that saves can never be alone. And why? Why is that true? Because we are literally created for good works. Christian, you have been created for good works. We are God's workmanship. The word in the Greek is poema. And every time in the New Testament this word is used, it is speaking of God creating something out of nothing. So we are his work of art. We are his poem. We are his song. And we are created. In salvation, Christian, we become a new creation. Don't miss that. Just as God spoke the sun into existence when he said, let there be light, about eight years ago he spoke life into these dead bones and bid me get out of my grave. And brothers and sisters, I am a new creation. And if you are a Christian, so are you. It is 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, 
Let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. When we were dead, we saw no glory in the face of Jesus. But God, but God has shown in our hearts that we may see the power of God's salvation that we may worship and praise his glorious grace for all eternity and that we may walk in the good works that he has prepared for us. Those who are blown away by the grace of God walk in new life, doing good works. Because of grace, they die to themselves. They serve others. They share the gospel. They love their neighbors. And most importantly, they love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. If you show me someone who is walking in the carnality of their flesh with more joy in creation than in the creator and with no desire to do the work of God, brothers and sisters, regardless of what they profess, I will show you someone who does not know Christ. So, how do we respond? How should we respond to the powerful grace of God? It depends on which one of these two people you are. If you are the first, if you are a Christian, then you respond with remembrance. Remember, the grace has been poured out lavishly on you. You were dead and God made you alive. Remember that it took power to save you. Remember that you were saved to display his grace. Remember that you do not deserve it. And remember that you were created for good works. And if the second describes you, if you do not know Christ, I pray that your heart has been compelled by the gospel today. If you look at your heart and you see no real desire for God, I pray that you will respond by pleading for salvation. Cry out to him for mercy. Plead with him to save you. Pray that he would open the eyes of your heart that you may see and know him. Ask him to make you alive. You have heard the gospel today. Jesus is the only one who saves. It is my prayer that we may respond properly to his grace. Let us pray to that end. Oh God, you know that we need your grace. We need your grace more than we need to breathe. For it is you alone who are good and loving and kind. And oh God, I pray that your power in the gospel will go forth as you promised it would in the lives of men and women today. We ask all these things in your precious and powerful name. Jesus, amen. was lost in darkest night yet thought I knew the way the sin that promised joy in life had led me to the grave I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will and if you had not love me first I would refuse you still but as I ran my hellbound ring indifferent to the cross you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the
the cross and I beheld God's love displayed you suffered in my place you bore the For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, 
What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe according to the working of His great might? That He worked in Christ Jesus when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let's pray. Father, we ask now that as you open the eyes of our heart to see that we would all joyfully acknowledge that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the one raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, and then in Christ, in Christ, we have been raised with you. And now we are a part of your church, your body, the fullness of you who fills all and in all. So Lord, we recognize there is darkness in this world, and you have called us, your people, in works prepared beforehand that we would walk in them that we would bring the light to bear in this world. So Lord, now, as we go in a few moments and as we give right now, oh God, would you use our giving and our going to make this gospel known. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Ushers, you can receive the offering while I move to this next section. Today is a joyful day for me as I... I've witnessed these young men preaching and thinking about the things of God that are going on among us. And this is a culmination as I share with you now about the Carol Ryan Scholarship. The Carol Ryan Scholarship is for seminary students who acted on the call of God while a member of Parkwood Baptist Church. Carol Ryan was a a godly woman. And I don't say that lightly. This, she was a godly woman, who, a woman of prayer, a woman who loved the Lord. She loved her family. There, see her right there where you guys just kind of raise your hand. Children and grandchildren, her husband. Thank you for being here, Ryan family. Traveled from South Carolina and Georgia to be here. She loved people. I was one of those people who was a recipient of Carol Ryan's love. She loved this local church. She loved the kingdom of God. She had a special place in her heart of helping people who were in seminary and their families. As a result, after her untimely death to cancer, the family decided to endow a scholarship in her honor to continue to what she did largely in private to help young people go to seminary and prepare for vocational ministry. They continue to contribute generously to that scholarship today. And you need to know that it is open for you as a church because it is a part of this local church for you to contribute to as well. Let me encourage you in that end. Because since 2006, when the scholarship first made its first scholarship offering, until today, including what we're doing today, This scholarship has provided over $183,000 in scholarship awards to seminary students from this local church. (laughs) 31 individuals have received this scholarship at least one time. That means an average gift of over $6,000 to each person. This year... This scholarship awards $24,000 to 12 individuals, four of them receiving it for the first time. They are as follows. Joseph Anderson, who just preached. Andrew Burgess, who has served on our staff, who who just resigned and is going full-time to seminary this fall to complete his education. Brett Day, who just joined our staff as an apprentice. J.G. Falk, who is serving in First Baptist Gaffney. Anna Long, 
who is very dear to me, my daughter, who is preparing at Southeastern and leads our great commission team, Nick Majors, who is doing a PhD at Midwestern Seminary, Danny Martin, who gives himself to prison ministry. Many of you see him seated here on the front row with men every Sunday that he brings after he leads and preaches at a worship service at the prison. Adam Mahaffey, who is an elder at Seven Oaks, who is working on his doctorate and hopes to come and, and serve in a local church in vocational ministry. Jacob Menear, who has served on the field, who has recently returned home. Andrew Morrow, who preached at the 8 o'clock service, pastoral apprentice. Colin Roberts, who serves on our staff and, and oversees what happens so that we can hear and see the worship service every Sunday. And Garen Stewart, who came out from among us and now serves at Mercy Church. Each of these are still in seminary and working, and there's are your recipients. This, this, this scholarship has had a huge impact on our staff. Ben Francis, who I'll say a minute more about in a moment, received this scholarship. Andrew Brafford, Scott Hand, who serve on our staff now, years ago were seminary students who are now back impacting this local church. This church has become a sending culture, a place where we prepare young men and women for, the, for gospel ministry and then we send them out. So this scholarship has kingdom impact not just congregational impact as people go and I am grateful to that end so would you join me in praying and giving thanks father thank you thank you for what you've done over the years through the Carol Ryan scholarship thank you for the Ryan family and their generosity thank you for Carol Ryan and for her witness and example I pray you would multiply that thinking that desire because the gospel outlives all of us. It is the power of God to salvation. It will continue until you come. So Lord, give us the wisdom. Give us the desire to do these kind of good works for the sake of the kingdom of God. Bless those, Lord, whom we are investing in and use them powerfully. And God, we pray for Ben, Francis, and for Tara and for their sweet family as they head to Teresa Baptist Church in Roxborough for him to pastor and lead, empower him, work through him. Thank you for his work and influence in this local church over the last four years. And I pray now that you bless and use him as he goes. For it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. At the conclusion of the service, I'll remain down here for a few moments. What you've heard today Pastor Joseph will be there with me, and there will be others who you could talk to. Anybody in a blue shirt, it's a person for you to ask questions or uh, pursue if there's anything that you'd like to know. And there is a reception in the fellowship hall for Ben and Tara for you to stop by there. There's some refreshments for those of you that are starving. you got to have lunch right now. There's some refreshments while you wait to speak. Please go by and bless and encourage Ben and Tara as they go from us. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. To heaven's king Boundless love Has won the day The sin of man Is washed away You came as a servant Selfless and perfect, death was defeated, and the stone was rolled away. Now angels acclaim you, creation awaits you, heaven.